Good evening, and welcome to Full Moon Matinee. I'm your host, The Detective, bringing you the finest crime dramas and film noir from the golden age of Hollywood. But tonight's picture is not from Hollywood, it's from the United Kingdom. <laughs> yes, once again, yet another from our dear British friends from across the big water. It's from 1954, The Black Glove, starring Alex Nicole, Eleanor Summerfield, and John Salou. And, you know, I just love these British noirs. And to commemorate the occasion, I picked up a bottle of scotch. <laughs> this is, uh, it's Spayburn. Uh, I, I was in Scotland a few years ago, sampled it there and brought some back. And I'm very fortunate that there's a liquor store just down the road that carries it. So it's imported here to the U.S. So I had to pick that up just to celebrate the occasion. Now, film noir, and I've discussed this before, film noir began as an American construct in the early 1940s. Uh, most film historians regard 1941's The Maltese Falcon as having been the first. But the genre caught on. Uh, it became very popular worldwide so that by the mid and late 1940s, other countries started doing their own, including the UK. Now, tonight's picture is from Hammer Productions. And now, Hammer Productions, years later, in the late 1950s through the early 70s, Hammer Productions became iconically famous for their horror films, especially the ones starring the tandem duo Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee. You know, those films were iconic, but in their earlier years, Hammer was much more well-rounded. You know, they did a little bit of all genres, including noirs. Now, tonight's picture, it's, it was released in the UK under the title Face the Music, but it was distributed here in the US under the title The Black Glove. And being as I'm on this side of the big water, that's the copy I was able to find. But it is known both ways. And it is a film noir crime drama mystery. It's about an American musician who goes on tour to Great Britain but is soon accused of murdering a very attractive jazz singer. But the police don't have enough to hold him, so they have to let him go, and he begins to gather clues on his own, including visiting her showbiz sister. Eventually, he gets the list narrowed down to four suspects. Who done it? <laughs> so, from 1954 in the United Kingdom, The Black Glove. Tally ho!
Congratulations, Fred. Fine show. Thanks, Marston. Thanks a lot. Bradley, you're yes, wonderful. Uh, thank you very nice. much. Oh, all right, pal. I can manage. Just call me a cab, will you? What do you want a cab for? Where are you going? I got a party all lined up for you. Everybody who's anybody in show business is going to be there. They'll need traffic lights for all the coming and the going. Maxie, I love you. We've been together a long time. You picked me up in a gin mill and made me an international name, but sometimes I could wring your neck. Why, what do you mean? I don't get you. We wound up the last show in New York at 4 a.m. I didn't sleep that night because you had to throw me a farewell party. I couldn't sleep coming over on the plane because you had to explain the timetable of our European tour for me. Today is Monday. I haven't slept in three days. I haven't even had time to smoke a cigarette. Man, have mercy. I don't know what you mean. Why are you speaking riddles? You've got time for a smoke now. You amaze me. You really amaze me. Oh, come on, baby. I'll find a nice, glamorous blonde for you. The only glamour I want at this time of night has four legs, a blanket, and a pillow. Cab's waiting, Miss Bradley. All right, thanks. Bye, Maxie. Make my excuses at the party. But, Brad, you can't Maybe just... I can't, but I'm doing it. Oh, um, keep that glamorous blonde for tomorrow. After leaving Maxie to deal with the party, I jumped a taxi and headed for home. There were only two things I wanted to do, eat and sleep. Now this was my first view of the London lights, but man, that traffic. To avoid it, we turned off into a side street, but that only made things worse. And that's how I met Maxine Halbard. Isn't the great? 
great James Bradley himself. You look just like your photos, sir. The name, ma'am, is Brad. And why haven't I seen any photos of you? Anyone who could sing like that would have their picture on the front page of Downbeat. That's a mighty nice thought. You must communicate it to the editor someday. I've tried to let it, but it doesn't seem to work. What do you know? What else can you do? I can drink. Shall we continue this brilliant conversation in a bar? I need food, not drink. Well, I can cook, too. Now you tempt me. Brad, have you had a proper sit-down meal since you've landed in this country? Sit-down meal? No, no. It takes a singer to remember that a musician's got to eat like any other mortal, doesn't it? Where are we going? To the best spaghetti house in town. Hey, look, baby, I, uh, I don't want to impose. Come on with me out to a restaurant. All right, if you want to insult me, go and eat out. But I'm going to cook myself a meal. How long do you like your spaghetti cooked? Oh, about... about ten inches. <laughs> have, um, have you lived here all your life? Not yet. You can light the candles if you want to do something useful. Ah, oh, where are they? In the chest of drawers. Can't you find them? Oh, yes. Yes, sure. this last dance. You've had it. Sit down. <laughs> the night's a kitten. Let's give her some milk. What's this? Shea. Nice, dry, Spanish shea. Oh, no, no, no. I like mine wet. Well, the only other thing you can have is water. Never touch it. Unhygienic. Drink up and don't talk. Ashes to ashes, from dust to dust. Show me one woman a man can trust. It's chalk to chalk and clay to clay. Show me the woman a man won't betray. Sugar to sugar, salt to salt. If you won't have me, it sure ain't my fault. Gravel to gravel, sand to sand. Show me one girl that a man can understand. Maybe so, but it's a hundred to ten that women know even less about men. I gotta go. Why? Ask the clock. 
But you're having dinner with me tomorrow night, right? All right. But? But I don't want you to get the wrong idea. I've got a Canadian boy I'm in love with. I'm going to marry him as soon as he starts making some money. It figures. Well, I've got a girl, too. And I'm going to marry her as soon as she gets rich enough to keep me. Oh, Brad, I like you. You're the kind of man that can get around a girl without even getting off his chair. Let's break up this mutual admiration society before it gets the better of us. I'll call for you at the place. No, I'll call for you as soon as I'm free. I'll ring you about a half hour before to give you time to get dressed, okay? All right. I'll give you my number. I want to know what evidence you've got against my client. Mr. Margulis, don't excite yourself. You have the constitution of a man given to apoplexy. I resent your attitude. We are guests in your country. Mr. Bradley is a famous man. He earns $3,000 a week. Most enviable, Mr. Margulis. But does it really have any bearing on the fact that he ought to tell us where he spent last night? Glad to oblige, Inspector. Shall we send Max out of the room while we go over the spicy detail? You keep your mouth shut until the lawyer arrives. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Before the day's over, you'll be talking of habeas corpus, the Magna Carta, and the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. Come, come, Mr. Margulis. Never mind, Inspector. I'll be glad to tell you all my secrets. But first, maybe you'd better tell us what this whole thing's about. It's about a young lady named Maxine Halbert. Oh? You know her? Well, I'd better. Anything wrong with that? That depends. Just tell us how you happened to meet her. Well, I was driving home after the show, minding my own business. And all of a sudden, there she was, in a cellar. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be serious, Mr. Bradley. I can't think of any time in my adult life when I felt less humorous. You barge in at 7 o'clock in the morning before I barely had a couple of hours sleep. A couple of hours, you say. That makes it about 5 this morning. 4, 5, 6. That's an hour more or less between friends. How right you are. Time stands still for the dead. The what? The dead. Miss Halbert was murdered at about 4 o'clock this morning. For one who knew her so briefly as you did, Mr. Bradley, you seem unduly moved. She was shot by a four five. I suppose you didn't happen to bring a gun along with you, did you? Who killed her? We don't know, but we're most anxious to find out. To start with, Mr. Bradley, could you tell us where you think your trumpet might be right now? Here we are, Jock. The lab's finished with all this junk now. Fine collection for the police museum. Tell your client to keep out of mischief and stay within call of the Metropolitan Police. Did you hear that, Brad? I heard it. And you'd better see that he acts accordingly. How can I? You tell him he's a prime suspect in the murder case, all he does is walk out and shave. What can you do with a man like that? Come along, Mr. Margulis. I'll give you a few pointers. last I was alone, alone with my thoughts, 
Man, I liked that little chick, Maxine. And now I knew I'd never see her again. I... I felt low enough to cry. me that question over and over again. I tell you, I didn't make that record. But your name is on the label. I tell you, I know nothing about it. I'm no expert on music, Mr. Felt, but I've got a good ear for a tune. And that piano sounds to me exactly like yours. We played this record to all the editors of the Dance Band trade journals without telling them who was on piano. Everybody guessed it was you. How do we explain that? I tell you, I don't know. I don't know. Let me have some tea, please. Now, look, Mr. Colt. Let's start again at the beginning. You say you've never made any records with Maxine Halbert in all your life, right? That's right. In fact, you've never met Maxine Halbert in all your life. And that's right. Then we think you're lying. What? We think you've known Maxine Halbert a long time. And that you may well have made any amount of records with her. You've told us one untruth after another. We're not going to detain you. But we're determined to find out what you're hiding. You can go now. Aunt Gloria? Who's that? It's me. Oh. What's up? I want to see you. Well, I don't. I think you might. It happened. What happened? Maxine's dead. How'd she die? Hello. Certainly. Mr. Bradley, you're wanted on the phone. Who is it? Mr. Jeff Coltzer. 
Jeff Colt. That's the British band leader who plays that fine rocking piano. That's it. That's one guy I'd really like to meet. Hello. Hello, is that you, Bradley? This is Jeff Colt. You may have heard of me. Heard of you? Jeff, I've got all your records at home in my collection. Great stuff. Good. Well, I've got another I'd like you to hear sometime, if you will. Glad to. Send it over to my hotel. Oh, what's it called? I've got a man in New Orleans. Piano and vocal, no band. Okay. Well, nice to hear from you, man. Let's get together sometime. I'd like to, Brad. Sometime. You know, after you've had a chance to hear the record, I'll send it over by hand. Let me know what you think of it. Till then. So long. All right, boys, that's all for today. Oh, well, Fred, if, uh, if Max asks for me, tell him I've gone underground. Each cup you see down there has got the modern shape cup. What do we mean by modern shape cup? This is the shape cup. You see the little thing walks around. It's horizontally or not at all. I looked for this singer, and this, I guess, must be Barbara. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows or cares. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Get your drink to make it up. I wouldn't use force to stop you. Ask the man for the bottle. Say, if I asked her if she wanted to smoke, do you think she'd order a flamethrower? Ask her and see. What, uh, what happened to your pianist? Maybe he got bored and went out to read a good book. Maybe you're out to find a place where the customers listen to the music. Mm. What I mean, that guy's a musician. You don't say. He's got a left hand like a walking beam. Greatest two-handed piano player in the islands. Well, maybe that's going just a little bit too far. Can't go far enough with Johnny. Johnny? Johnny Sutherland, my piano player. Johnny Sutherland? Your guy? Ah. Excuse me, lady. I take back every word I said. You know whose guy he is? Nobody. You know who he's in love with? A diminished seventh chord. You know what happens to a chick who's crazy enough to go for him? Look at my sister. Your sister? Maxine Halbert. Read all about it. Papers are full of her. <laughs> what are you trying to do to Miss Barbara, mister? I'm trying to buy her a drink and make conversation. She doesn't seem to be interested in either. Miss 
Barbara shouldn't drink if she don't eat. Why doesn't she eat? He was that piano player of hers. I'd like to ask him a lot of questions. Some Lizzie is not too eager to answer them. What are you trying to say, mister? I won't say it. Not because I'm afraid of you. Because I've been warned you've got tough laws for slander in this country. We've got our own laws in this club, mister. One of them is you don't make cracks about Miss Barbara or Mr. Johnny. Oh. That's enough, boy. I think you'd better go now. So you're here at last. Where have you been all the afternoon? Have you seen what the papers say about your little escapade last night? You fool, you. Why don't you leave the chicks alone? Oh, Max, be your age. You said you wanted to go to bed. A great joke. You said you wanted to go to sleep. Ha <laughs> ha. And you ran out on me when I had a party lined up with all the big names and pretty show business there. Not to mention a glamorous blonde. By the way, whatever happened to her? Naturally. Don't change the subject. On the contrary, I'd like to linger on it. I tell you this. If you run out on me again, I'll quit you. That's what I do. I'll you're on, Mr. Bradley. Saved by the bell. When I got back from the Palladium that night, I found all my mail in three neat piles, the way Max likes to arrange it. Fan letters, business correspondence, personal mail. Except that he put one large envelope exactly halfway between the business and the fan mail. A picture of old Maxie in a quandary. Try to get Mr. Jeff Coles at the Montpelier Hotel, please. Jeff, this is Bradley. Hope I didn't get you out of bed. Nonsense. I'm a night owl. I just got back from work. Sorry I couldn't tell you I'd move. I'm a bit sudden. Come on over and have a drink. Oh, good. Good. I could use one. It's been a rough day. It's 55, Park Lane. 
Right away. Well, what did you think of the record? What I wanted to ask you about it was uh, how you play that bass part after the vocal. You know, where the treble goes down and the bass up. Do you want me to show you on the piano? Let it help. In fact, Jeff, you didn't play on that record. I hope you'll tell that to the cops. How come? I'd like you to be my character witness. You're the most important figure in the band business now in this country. If you tell them I've never played for Maxine, maybe they'll stop thinking that I've bumped her off. You bumped her off? I thought I was supposed to be the star suspect. Oh, don't believe the headlines. You just happen to be the most newsworthy character they've quizzed. Well, us humble mortals have been quizzed as well. And I tell you, I don't like it. Oh. What'd they do with you? They said, what do you know of Maxine Halbard? I said, nothing. They said, yeah? Then how come you've been making records with her? I said, how could I have been making records with her when I've never even met her? They said, that's what we want to know, and so on and so on. Man, it was weird. They then produced that disc I sent you. Now, they said, who is playing it if it isn't you? You know, I couldn't tell them. This chap, whoever he is, plays so much like me, it was like looking in a mirror and seeing a ghost. Who can it be? I don't know, Jeff. But one thing you can be sure of, it wasn't me. Oh, come off it, Brad, I know that. All I want to know is what you know about it. You know the cops say that you were the last person to see Maxine alive, that she was playing that record for you, because it was still on the gramophone, and the turntable was running when they found her. That's news. Why? Didn't they tell you about it? No. But now they've got the two of us together, I'll bet you they will. And before breakfast, too. Only this time, I'm going to be ready for them. Good night, Jeff. Good night, Brad, and thanks. I told you everything was all right, darling. Why don't you guys get yourselves a key? The one thing you can do if you must disturb a working man at this hour is let yourselves in and bring some coffee. Yuck, yuck, yuck. What does that mean in English? I'll tell you, but remember you asked for it. A yuck is what they call someone in Ireland. Too low to kick and too wet to step on. Go on, you fascinate. Why didn't you tell us about your meeting with Mr. Colt? Maybe because I haven't had time yet. And what were you doing with Maxine's sister? So I have to tell you, she's of age and so am I. Oh, no, for mercy's sake. We certainly never mentioned her to you. What do you know about her? How did you come to pick on her? Very simple. A big bartender about eight feet tall gave me a shove, and there I was, right in her arms. <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> What's going on around here? Oh, nothing to worry about, Maxie. Just having a quiet little game of conversation. As a matter of fact, we've had it. Goodbye, Mr. Bradley. Oh, won't you stay for tea and toast, Mr. McKenzie? <laughs> it's the fastest piece of police work I've seen east of Hollywood. <laughs> that little bit of snapper McKenzie is trying to show up his own boss, I bet you. See the way he ran when he saw me? Can't put anything over old Max. Be 
big words, little man. Before you talk that way to me, big man, let's be sure you keep your engagements. Why, did I lose any? You crazy trumpet player, you're supposed to work in this country, not jazz around. Maxie. We've had two recording sessions after us. An appearance on TV, three personal appearances in clubs and other spots, and where are you? Jazzing around, like you say. Leaving me to work out the agenda for you. Wait till you hear what you've got to do today to catch up with what you missed yesterday. <laughs> I'll tell you over breakfast. Oh, breakfast is one thing I've got to skip, Maxie. Where are you going this time? I'm going out. I can see that. You're not going to see another dame. I'm certainly not going to see the same one. Bye, Maxie. Be good. Musicians? Why did I ever get mixed up with the musicians? <laughs> Cops been grilling a lot of people about the unusual record they found in Maxine's room. Would you rather tell them where you got your copy, or would you prefer to talk to me instead? It's no secret. I got it from Maxine herself. If that's what you're chasing me for. You're wasting your time. You say Maxine gave it to you. She tell you who played piano for her? There are no uh, names in the label. Sounds like uh, Jeff Colt to me. Is that what she said? She didn't say anything. Then why'd she give it to you? Well, we were kicking around together. How can you say why you give something to a chick or she gives you something? How did you know I had a copy anyway? I didn't know. I was only guessing. What I can't make out is, who makes these grammar discs? There's no such job for listed in the directory. That'd be Maury's private company. He turns out those discs mostly for musicians, for audition records, air shots. That's no secret either. Uh, who's Maury? Maury Green. He owns the Green Recording Company, made a veil. Friend of yours? Maury hasn't got any friends who don't ring up cash for him. I'm a musician, not a commercial asset. Would he know the difference? Maury's got the finest set of ears in the business. He could hear a pound note hit a plush carpet a mile away. Is that all you want to know? No, I want to know a lot more, Johnny. But it looks like I've come to the wrong address. I think I'll have to pay Mr. Green a visit. Why? I've got an idea that anybody who had anything to do with this record is in danger of getting themselves killed. 
just like Maxine. You don't get it? You don't. You tell me what you know, maybe I can help. I think you're stalling, Johnny. So long. Hello again. Now, we see here when he goes to visit Barbara, you know, Maxine's sister, he finds that address on the back of the envelope and it says she lives in Soho. Soho is a district in the western part of London. Uh, it was founded hundreds of years ago. Originally, it was an aristocratic district, you know, a place where the upper crust and the blue bloods lived. Uh, but by the late 1800s, Soho began to evolve into becoming an entertainment district. And that's where we see all of these scenes in these jazz clubs here. And of course, you know, James, even though he's playing in a big band, he loves to visit the small jazz clubs. And they're pretty much what you see depicted here. You know, in this era, jazz clubs were typically small basement clubs. You know, they, they, they weren't large venues because jazz in this era was seen as being very seedy. It was seen as the music of the underworld. It did not enjoy a great reputation. Uh, it, it, it wouldn't become more mainstream until later years, say by the late 1950s and through the 60s. But in this era, yeah, it was typically in small basement clubs. And here we see a lot of Yank musicians, you know, trying to make it in London. And, and that would have been pretty typical for the era. <laughs> yeah, Yanks. That's their term for us. They call us Yanks. <laughs> Short for Yankees. <laughs> I find it to be a very endearing term. Now, Alex Nicole, and he's the one playing James Bradley, he was born in Ossining, New York. Uh, it is just north of New York City. In fact, in more modern years today, it's probably considered a suburb by now. Uh, but his father uh, was his father was the arms keeper at Sing Sing Prison, which is located there, and that is a very famous maximum security prison. But Alex began acting on stage. Uh, which did include Broadway. But then World War II came along and he served with the 101st Cavalry of the New York National Guard and uh, eventually reaching the rank of Tech Sergeant. But when the war was over, he resumed his stage work and began acting in films in the early 1950s. In fact, uh, now for, for his films, he mostly did westerns, but his first film was a noir. He was in 1950's The Sleeping City. He had the role of Steve Anderson, and he was in that with Richard Conte and Colleen Gray. Now, his best remembered films were westerns, especially The Redhead from Wyoming. Uh, he was in that opposite Maureen O'Hara, and also the man from Laramie. Uh, but he did, obviously, tonight's picture's the evidence, he did travel to England. He did three films over in England. Uh, the notables being The House Across the Lake and, of course, tonight's picture, both being from 1954. Now, one thing I want to make a note here. Alex Nicole is not playing the trumpet in these scenes. The trumpet, the, the trumpet playing was dubbed in by Kenny Baker, and we saw his name in the opening credits. You know, you know, it was, you know, starring Kenny Baker and uh, his orchestra, what was called Kenny Baker's Dozen. 
you know, they, they were a big band of the era. But yeah, it, it, it's Kenny Baker who's dubbing in the trumpet playing. So let's get back to the Black Glove. Mr. Green will see you now, sir. Thank you. How flattering to have you visitors, Mr. Bradley. Sit down, won't you? What can we do for you? I'd like to uh, thank you. I'd like to record some experimental stuff. Just for my own ears, you understand? Some of the boys have been telling me about those... Uh... Oh, thanks. About those grammar discs you make for them. I was thankful. Who was it? Well, there was uh, Johnny Sutherland, the piano player, for one. I never heard of him. The only Sutherland I knew used to be a circus artist. And Barbara Quigley. Quigley? Yeah, Barbara Quigley. Sings in a joint called the Underground Club. I never heard of that one, either. I must be losing touch with the new crowd that's coming up. Well, the old crowd liked you, too. I heard one you made for uh, Jeff Colt and uh, Maxine Halbard. Jeff Coat, Maxine Halvard? Oh, that's crazy. I've been running after those two for years to give me a commercial recording contract. They always tell me my records weren't good enough. Someone must have converted them. I heard the record myself. It was real fine. That's absurd. If we've got a disc with them, I ought to be the first one to know, oughtn't I? Could be. I guess so. Miss Poulton. Could you check through the files and see if we've ever made a record with Maxine Halvard or Jeff Colt? How'd you come across this mystery record, Mr. Bradley? Oh, the, uh, the cops found it. Right beside Maxine, the night she was murdered. But why wasn't that ever mentioned in the newspapers? Why wasn't I told? Don't ask me. Ask the cops or the newspapers. You know, someone who doesn't care too much for me might have stuck my label on somebody else's disc just to make trouble. I'm sorry, Mr. Green, but I can't find any entries for Maxine Halvard or Jeff Cope. I've been through the whole interview. That's all right, Miss Poulton. I didn't think you would. Well, Mr. Bradley, when do you think you want to do your recording session? Oh, in a couple of days. I'll have my manager call you and fix a date. Good. Mr. James Bradley, the world-famous trumpet player and palladium headliner. Why didn't you introduce yourself the first time? Just shyness, Miss Quigley. Who told you my name? A little birdie. Come into my parlor. You sure I'm not intruding? I uh, don't want any more quiet conversation with your eight-foot protector. <laughs> Mickey, he's as kind as a lapdog. You just stroked him the wrong way. Well, if you teach me how to stroke them the right way, I'll give you a box of chocolates. Chocolates? Well, what do you know? Flowers, too. This is a rare day. How come? A pretty girl like you should have more flowers and have vases to put them in. More chocolates than she has room for in her 22-inch weight. Now, don't tell me you have to worry about putting on weight. If I hadn't stopped worrying about those things long ago, I'd have to worry more about losing weight than putting it on. Oh, look. I used to be full of puppy fat when I was sweet 16. <laughs> Amuse yourself with those while I make some coffee.
You never told me what brought you here, Mr. Bradley. Just a social visit. I wanted to apologize for the trouble at the club. What brought you to the club in the first place? Oh, you, of course. Why? Oh, I, I'd heard a lot about you. Great little voice. Always interested in new talent. You never heard about me, Mr. Bradley. Not about my voice, anyway. Come on, what's it all about? I saw your name on the back of an envelope that Maxine wrote a phone number on. I didn't know you were sisters. I was just looking up everyone she knew, that's all. Why? Because I liked her. It's a funny thing. Everybody liked Maxine. Nobody likes me. <laughs> that's a silly thing to say. What's wrong with you? That's what I'd like to know. Look. Those days, I used to look pretty good, too. Who's this? Third sister? No, no, that's Gloria Lewis. We call ourselves the Bardsley Triplets. We never made the grade together. But we had the best vocal trio in the world for a year or so. We'd have taken on the Andrews sisters with bare knuckles for 12 rounds. Ah, <laughs> uh, happy days. That's right. Everyone was poor and no one was either. Me and Johnny. We'd have made the grade together, but... Here's his manager. He wanted him in the big time and bingo, that killed it. You don't have to tell me about managers. Ah, oh, now that's Johnny when he was really good. You told me you had a vocal trio. This looks like a circus act. Oh, yes, it is. This was after the trio broke up. Johnny had a two-gun act. He used to shoot with two hands simultaneously. Both hands? Mm. I got me a job playing target for him. I had faith in that man. Ah, I can see that. Hey, wait a minute. What's this? That's the wrong thing. Maxine. Yes, Maxine and Johnny. That's what broke it up. She thought he was too good for the circus. She thought he ought to be a musician. So what did she do but take his guns away from him? Now look where it's gone. Look what's got her. What are you trying to say? <laughs> Barbara. I'm sorry.
See you in jail, buddy. Hey, wait a minute. Hey. Uh, don't go away. Let's talk. Well, I don't want to break up your party. That's all right. Come on, beat it, fellas. Get out, will you? I'm busy. Come on in. Come on. All right, get out. Come on, fellas. Come on, shit. Johnny, why do you have your initials on the gun? What are you talking about? Look, don't play around with me. I know all about the Gunfighter Act, about the man Barbara calls the greatest two-handed piano player bar none. If you can shoot two guns at the same time at a living target, you must be ambidextrous. Who better to imitate Jeff Colt? How's that? because he's left-handed. When he plays those cross-hand patterns that are his trademark, he doesn't do it to show off. He does it because he can't play any other way. You got it all figured out, haven't you? Well, all except why you made that record. It's no secret. Just another job. Mighty weird kind of job. It's just a gimmick record. Everybody's doing impersonations of singers. Why not an impersonation of a piano player? I was going to do one side like Shearing, one side like Tatum, one side like Jeff, and so on. So, well, if that's all it was, why didn't you tell me about it before? How could I? I'm the guy the cops were looking for. I was going steady with her. I had a date with her that night. And? I just didn't get out of the club, that's all. Barbara can tell you that. The barman can tell you. But will the police believe me? Johnny, I'm not the police, and I don't know all the answers. But if what you're telling me is true, my lawyer can help you. I'll go see him, fix up a date for you. Why are you doing all this stuff? What do you got to hide? How do I know you're not the guy that killed my girl? You don't. Any more than I know that you're not the guy who killed her. But don't talk like that, Johnny. You can't stop me. You might be rich and famous. But in this country, people don't just walk into a woman's flat in the middle of the night without finding out if maybe there isn't a man who minds. Where I come from, if a man minds, his woman won't ask anybody into her flat. Now then, what are you two characters fighting about? Is that any business of yours? Who invited you in? Next time, don't pick on a guy who's got enough troubles already, eh, Brad? Okay, Johnny. Don't you go slugging a guy who means you no harm. There's much left in life for me anyway. Now beat it, will you? Take care of yourself. Now, you must admit, Max, that, that this kind of thing can't go on. Bradley involved in club riot? There's a limit to what the public will put up with. What I can't understand is how he got into the papers in the first instance. The cops didn't get hold of the story. How did the papers? Somebody talks and that's that. Yeah, but who and why? The question is not who or why, but what do we do now? Now we all have a drink. You great comedian. Have you seen this? Don't believe everything you read in the papers, Max. The point is not whether Max believes what he reads in the papers, but whether the public does. Do you know what you are, Brad? B.O.P. Box office poison. Will anyone tell me why I spent ten years trying to build him up? Maybe because you couldn't resist my charm, sweetheart. <sighs> well, it's been ten years too much. I tell you, unless you behave yourself, I quit. All right, then quit. Now, don't be silly, Bradley. That's easier said than done. Abuse rolls off my back like a duck. Which leaves you holding the bag, Vic. Goodbye. I suppose I'd better go after him and calm him down. You do what you like. He's my manager, not my nurse. If he wants to go, let him go. You're like little children, both of you.
Let's go, Mr. Bradley. How we do it? Sold right out. If you play on stage the way you did just now, you'll keep them coming for as long as the management will hold you over. I felt like yesterday's corpse when I finally got away that night. But having found out what I was after at Johnny's, I had to check back with Barbara. Certainly my day for getting knocked about. Mine too. Looks like my third fight in two days. Not counting the one with you. I'm sorry about that. Never mind. Help me up, Brad. Well, this, uh, this could get to be a pleasant habit. <laughs> Maybe you sent that man to knock me out just so that you could play good Samaritan afterwards. <laughs> what happened to my door? That's what you get for screaming behind it when it's locked. You know who it was? What they were after? Some sneak thief, I guess, that one could hope to find in this sad rat hole of a flat. I can't imagine. Oh, how'd he get in? I don't know. I came in here to answer the door and there he was. Maybe your wife sent him here to see what you were up to. I'm a bachelor. But maybe the rest of what you say is true. Is there anything missing? I doubt it. There's nothing here that anyone but a lunatic would want to take away. Maybe it was a lunatic. I've got the strangest feeling in the back of my neck that someone might throw a knife at me at any minute. Turn your back to the wall and there won't be room for anyone to throw anything. I feel like I've had my back to the wall ever since I first set foot in this country. I wish I knew why. Well, while you ponder that question, I'll go and wash my face. If you find the answer, let me know.
I just had an idea. Why don't you stick around while I get you some food? First, because it's gowlish the way the girls in this country invite you to dinner. You never can tell what the night holds for you. Second, because I've got a taxi waiting outside. Any more questions? Yes, when do I see you again? Well, how about tomorrow night? Suppose I leave a ticket for you at the box office for the first show, okay? Okay, Brad. And thanks for the flowers. Oh, it's nothing. I do it for all the girls. Will you be all right? Yes, I'll lock my bedroom door. Good night. Good morning, sir. And a very good morning it is. Is it? Hey, uh, I'll tell you what I'd like to do. I'd like to rent uh, a car for the day. You know, one of those uh, drive-yourself service jobs. You know what I mean? Maybe I'll see some of this famous English countryside I've heard so much about. Uh, what time would you like the car, sir? Well, I could be ready in about half an hour. Very good, sir. The car will be waiting downstairs when you're ready. Uh, that's what I call service. Thanks very much. Good luck, Jeff. You'll need it. small figure after the key letter is the serial number. That's right. And the last number? So oh, that's only used for the grammar disc series when we don't cut more than half a dozen copies or so. If you cut just two copies of one of your grammar discs, they'd automatically be marked one and two. That's right. You see, on this little machine here, which we built ourselves, each recording is registered consecutively. So we can check and find out exactly how many records we made on any given day. This machine will keep tabbing us. And you can tell me exactly when this, this grammar disc was made and how many copies of it were cut. Yeah, if it's one of ours, I'll be able to. Let's have a look. Mm Mr. Sutherland, please. You're sure this is one of your records? Positive. And you're also sure that just two copies were made? No more, no less? I'm sure of everything except who did the work. I certainly didn't, and there's no entry in the file. That beats me. So you'd better look out, Johnny. I've got to go now, but you'd better do just as I told you. So long. Thanks very much. Sorry I missed Mr. Green. Well, that's all right. I'll tell him everything you tell me. Later that day, I went deeper into the English countryside to find the answer to a missing photograph from Barbara's album. Maroney? Mr. Bradley for you, sir. I'll put him through. He's through now, sir. Hello, Mr. Bradley. About 
time I heard from you. What have you been doing, Mr. Bell? As if you don't know. Still, I do have some news for you. If you want to stop over at the Palladium before the first show tonight, I'll tell you who killed Maxine Alvoy. See you then, Inspector. Yes. Just had a call from Bradley, giving him a free hand has paid off. Here's a list of people. Round them up and get them here as soon as possible. Have Mr. and Mrs. Cope picked up first. They may be on the way to Waterloo. They're booked on the boat train in half an hour. Get them back. What then? We're off to the Palladium for a little fun and games. Bradley's playing with dynamite. I only hope it doesn't go off before we get there. You're ready early, Mr. Bradley. There's more than an hour to go yet. I've got a feeling tonight's going to be special. Besides, I'm expecting some very important guests. So it's almost time for them to be here now. Go out to the stage door and arrange to have them brought in as soon as they get here. Will you please? Yes, sir. Should be all right now. Let him take his time. The next time you get yourself poisoned, just send me a postcard from the morgue, Mr. Bradley. The next time you work on a murder case, Inspector, don't steal my photographs while I'm having my tummy pumped out. Your photographs? Well, let's just say I borrowed them. They certainly provided for a lot of entertainment. Take this one, for example. The Bardsley triplets. Who, of course, are neither triplets nor named Bardsley. Pass it over to Mrs. Colt, will you please? Might bring back some happy memories. And here's the fourth member of the Bardsley triplets. Their pianist, Mr. Jeff Colt. Really, Mr. Colt? You told us at the yard that you didn't know Maxine Halbert. You recognize this one, Jeff? Now, in the course of their promising career, the Bardsley triplets frequently found themselves in the same bill as a uh, a trick shooting act that went under the name of the gunfighter. Here's the gunfighter with his manager. Will you pass that along to Mr. Green, Jeff? Now, Mr. Green once told me that the only Johnny Sutherland he knew was a circus performer. It was so true, it almost threw me off the track. And here's our next picture. Young Love and Bloom, Maury and Maxine. That's a perfectly harmless little holiday snap. I can't see how you can draw any conclusions from that. Oh, but I can. The trouble is, it was harmless. Love, Mr. Green, is often a one-sided business. Barbara can tell you that. Am I right in saying, Mr. Green, that 
You and Johnny broke up as a team when Maxine told you she was in love with him. Who told you that? And that the Bardsley triplets broke up over the same affair, with Barbara accusing Maxine of having muscled in on Johnny. Let's not talk about it, Brad. That's all done with. Barbara, you always have been the forgiving and forgetting type. If I'd been in your place, I'd have cut Maxine's throat then and there. Do we take that in evidence against you, Mrs. Colt? Do what you like. You can't frighten me. If I'd been in Barbara's shoes, this whole thing wouldn't have happened in the first place. I'd have seen to it that no man of mine was ever left alone with Maxine. Did you make that a condition of your marriage with Jeff when he proposed to you? As a matter of fact, I did. When I heard he'd been chasing around after her, I packed my bags and swore I'd never go back as long as she was alive. You've been mighty successful, Gloria. You got your man and Maxine is dead. All right, now wait for it. Wait. This is getting to be interesting. Proceed, Mr. Bradley. Johnny, you told me you never kept your appointment with Maxine that night. Is that true? Oh. Huh? No, it isn't. How do you know? Were you there? I was. And I saw somebody going into Maxine's house with a record under his arm right after I left. Maxine wasn't dead then, Johnny. And no record was visible in her room when I left it. All right, Mr. Sutherland. You'd better tell us exactly what happened. Why don't you let him tell you? He seems to know everything. All I know is that the murderer was waiting in the phone booth across the street. And after I left, he went over to Maxine's door. Oh, hello. What's up? Maxine knew her visitor well enough to take him right up to her room. He was well enough at home to walk right up to the chest of drawers and open it. Maxine must have been baffled, but still not worried. But at last she realized that something more than a poor practical joke was going on. What are you doing with that gun? Put it down! No! as Mr. Bradley has described it, except for one little thing. The gun was no longer there. For if it had been, Mr. Sutherland, you would have found yourself arrested before dawn. You did go to Maxine's that night, Johnny. Realizing that the initials on the gun would tell the police... Realizing what the initials on the gun would tell the police, you took it away and hid it. We destroyed it, right? Yeah. Which brings us to the big question. Who killed Maxine? With only the record to work on, the police tackled Jeff, who in turn brought it to me. When I discovered it wasn't Jeff playing on the record, I asked myself, 
why anyone should want to go to such lengths to involve Jeff so definitely with Maxine. Now, Gloria's already told us how jealous she is of Jeff and what she'd do if she found out he'd been seeing Maxine. Well, this record would prove to Gloria that he had been seeing her. But Jeff played it smart. He fixed it so Gloria would be around to hear me say that the record was a fake. Now, you've all had good motives for wanting Maxine out of the way. But only one of you had motives enough to work out a plan that would involve other people. I didn't see the answer myself till Mr. Green told me casually that he'd been trying to put Jeff under contract for years, but Jeff had steadily refused. Now, Mr. Green, like many successful men, suffers from a peculiar inability to tolerate rejection. For example, when Maxine turned him down in favor of Johnny, his nerves cracked, and he went into the famous nursing home run by the late Dr. Weatherden in the country. I drove down there today to have a talk about Mr. Green. And what did you find? I found out that Dr. Weatherton had said that Mr. Green was a dangerous paranoid and should be detained until treatment is complete. That's a lie. All right, then what did he say? He said the treatment was complete and I was to be released. How do you know, Mr. Green? I saw it. Saw it with my own eyes and his notes about me. No, doctor. Least of all a psychiatrist would let a patient see his diagnostic notes. But I tell you, I saw them. Why are you persecuting me? Why is everybody always against me? Why don't you believe me? Oh, I believe you, Maury. The trouble is, all the papers concerning your case disappeared after Dr. Weatherden's death. I suppose now we know where to look for them. The only thing you forgot to destroy was the picture of Maxine and yourself outside the mental home. You thought of that only after I'd seen it in Barbara's album. You gave me my cue by trying to get rid of it. Otherwise, I might never have suspected a thing. It's all lies, lies, lies! You put the poison in the mouthpiece of my trumpet when my car was parked outside your studio this morning. If the inspector hadn't gotten here so fast, I'd be a dead man now and you'd be safe. I'm not caught yet. Before I go, Bradley, you interfering busybody, I'll fix you. <laughs> oh. Oh. Bradley, you hurt? No, but I would be if it hadn't been for this lunatic. Take him away. John Green. Why'd you do it, man? Better I get hit than you. You need your arm for your trumpet. Me, I only need mine for conversation. I thought you quit me. I can't quit you, baby. Where'd you be without me? In a coffin. Maybe then I'd get some sleep. It's only a nick. I'll soon fix it. <laughs> I suppose I'll have to tell them he's had an accident. We could put tennis band on without it. No, I know. They'd murder you out there. What's the trouble, fellas? Can I help? But, Brad, this is crazy. You're supposed to rest for a week. I can rest better playing my trumpet. No, not that again, please. Now, don't worry, Maxie. This is my old mouthpiece. Inspector Mulrooney has generously returned it for action.
Welcome back. Now, we see here that James Bradley, he might have been a trumpeter for a big band, but he certainly loved his small jazz clubs. And, you know, I wish that they had written a bigger part for Anne Hanslip. Uh, she was the one playing Maxine. She was pretty much only in the very beginning and the very end of the film. I mean, that was one gorgeous dame. Uh, you know, I, I wish I had a chance to look at her a little longer. <laughs> now, Eleanor Summerfield, and she's the one playing Barbara. She was born in St. Pancras. Uh, it, it's a district in central London. That's where she was born, and she did it all. Stage, film, television, radio. And her filmography is very considerable. She was in films from 1947 to 1982. Some of her notables, she was in 1949's No Way Back, 1954's Final Appointment, 1956's Odongo, and 1963's The Running Man. And she had a recurring role as Aunt Dahlia in the TV series The World of Worcester. It aired on BBC One from 1965 to 1967. She was also a regular member of a panel game show. Uh, it aired on BBC Radio. Uh, she was on two game shows that aired there. She was on Manny a Slip and Just a Minute. Now, John Salou, and he was the one playing Max, uh, James Bradley's agent, manager. John Salou was born in Portsmouth, England, which is on the south coast of England. I mean, it's on the English Channel. That's where he was born, and most of his career, he was a character actor, usually playing... Uh, suspicious looking or devious types. You know, that just seemed to be where he fit in his niche. And his filmography was considerable. I mean, he was in films from 1938 to 1961. Now, some of the films in which he had larger roles, he was in 1944's Time Flies, 1947's Uncle Silas, in 1954's Night of the Demon. Now, remember, if you like these types of movies, these types of pictures, click on the subscribe button. You'll be notified of future releases up here in the notification bell. And you can always just click on the Full Moon Matinee icon down here, or just type Full Moon Matinee in the search bar, and you can find all of the prior releases. And also, you know, post down here in the comments, you know, let me know what you thought of the movie or anything else that you're thinking. And, as always, I thank you for spending the evening with Full Moon Matinee. Stay with us as we continue our further investigations into the long-lost evidence of Hollywood and the United Kingdom. Until next time.